Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh Adventist Church, and this series is entitled Resting in Christ. This is lesson number three in that series entitled The Roots of Restlessness. It's the study for July 17 of 2021, and as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we depend on you for so much, life and health and all the, the benefits we, we enjoy, the, the words, the messages you have given us, and now help us not to be restless. Let us think about the disciples particularly in association with Jesus and to imagine that they could not somehow or other get over the idea that Jesus was going to establish an earthly kingdom. May we uh, look beyond ourselves to the truths that are spread out in your word so that we may become more like you, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Roots of Restlessness. We start off with an interesting illustration. Aspens are beautiful trees reaching 45 to 90 feet or 15 to 30 meters in height. They thrive in cold climates with cool summers. Their wood is used in furniture and also for making matches and paper. Deer and other animals often feed on young aspen trees during hard winters as their bark contains many nutrients. Aspens need lots of sunshine and they grow all the time, even in winter, making them important winter food sources for different animals. Aspens, however, are most notorious for the fact that they have one of the largest root systems in the plant world. I can just tell you that my brother planted an aspen in his yard many, many years ago, and now there's aspens coming up here and there. We, we drove place. through aspen groves within the last week in the mountains of Utah. Yes, plenty, oh. lots of aspens. 9,500 feet. Yeah. Well, the roots spread by underground suckers and form a colony that can spread relatively quickly covering large areas. Individual aspen trees can live up to 150 years, but the larger organism, that is the whole root system underground with all these different trees coming up, can live for thousands of years. Wow. That's from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sabbath, July 10. So now, what does that have to do with us and our thinking and Christianity? Well. What kind of hidden characteristics are found in our lives that keep us from being fully committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are we fully aware of these problems? We inherently avoid conflicts whenever we can. We prefer harmony and peace. What a surprise. Conflict resolution seminars are held frequently in churches and other institutions to try to avoid conflicts. And so, what do we know from the Bible, Jim? Matthew uh, chapter 10, verses 34 to 39. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the world. No, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. I came to set sons against their fathers, daughters against their mothers, daughters-in-law against their mothers-in-law. Your worst enemies will be the members of your own family. Those who love their father or mother more than me are not fit to be my disciples. Those who love their son or daughter more than me are not fit to be my disciples. Those who do not take up their cross and follow me in my, follow in my steps are not fit to be my disciples. Those who try to gain their own life will lose it, but those who lose their life for my sake will gain it. American Bible Society, 1992, Good News Translation. Wow, what a way to start off. But I thought Jesus was the Prince of Peace. How could someone who's called the Prince of Peace make a statement like that? What do we know about Prince of Peace, Kerry? Uh, reading from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and he will be our ruler. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace from the Good News Bible. Okay, he will be called lots of great things, but one of them is Prince of Peace. 
and eternal father. Yeah. You almost have to start singing when you hear those words. Don't yeah, you? exactly. Yes. Jesus could have come as a king on this earth, so powerful as to demand service and obedience from everyone on the earth. Instead, he arrives as a helpless baby boy, and yet, in his life, he constantly stirred up controversy. Why was that? The words above from Matthew 10 were spoken quite early in his Galilean ministry. So if, you, if Jesus were really to be lower on the scale, he would have come as a girl. Well, or, no, nobody would have listened to him. Or as a slave. Yes, Likewise, yep. no one would listen. Yeah. What in the world did disciples think when Jesus talked about a cross? Crosses certainly were the last thing, the farthest thing from their thinking. I mean, early in his ministry in Galilee, they were all excited because they, they have joined the, the most powerful, the most upcoming person that they know about, and he's going to be the king, right? What, would Jesus, what Jesus was really talking about was priorities. And it's possible that he may have been referring to Matthew 7, verse 6. I'm, I'm sorry, Micah 7, verse 6. In these Ira? times, sons treat their fathers like fools. Daughters oppose their mothers, and young women quarrel with their mothers-in-law. Does that mean they don't when they're older? They just do when they're younger? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> A person's enemies are the members of his own family. The good news. Mm. Well, we all, I hopefully, remember that the Fifth Commandment says we're required to honor our parents. So how does that fit in with this? Is it is easy to turn from our natural, or is it easy to turn from our natural loyalty to family members and make God first in our lives? I, I'm not a female, but I, the ones I associate with would have an awful hard time. They're even harder, I think, than the men. I was thinking about that when I read this, that yeah. as a mother, I can't speak as for fathers, but it would be very hard. So why did Jesus tell us to do that? Is a time coming when we have to make our allegiance to God top priority over, over every other allegiance? Well, as you said, it's priorities, setting priorities. What did Jesus mean when he said that if we make those other priorities higher than God, then we are not worthy or we're not fit? Is, I mean, is there something about being loyal to your family that would make you not fit to go to heaven? Yes. If you take the side of, of your husband, your child, whatever, knowing it's not, but because he's your or she, uh, you put away the right things to yep. keep the family together. Unfortunately, I know people, a lot of them, that have departed quite a bit from what they know is Christ, the true Christian way because they're married to somebody or there's somebody else in their family has uh, taken that and they just feel like, well, you know, let's, let's compromise a little bit and maybe we could sort of lead them back to Christ and what usually ends up happening is they're, be, they're being compromised away from Christ. Well. The, the, these disciples of Jesus, they didn't seem to want to follow, they did seem to want to follow Jesus, but a cross? They, they had no idea where Jesus was going to lead them. They were hoping, of course, that it would lead them to be rulers in an earthly kingdom. How many of them, here's a question, how many of them would have followed Jesus if they knew already at the beginning when he chose them that almost all of them were going to be end, up, end up being martyrs? Would we be willing to join that group? Well, could that happen to some of us? Yeah. The way the world is running, yes. So what advice did Ellen White have for our young people today? Gordon? From Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 87, I have no higher wish than to see our youth imbued with that spirit of pure religion which will lead them to take up the cross and follow Jesus. Go forth, young disciples of Christ, controlled by principle, clad in the robes of purity and righteousness. 
your Savior will guide you into the position best suited to your talents and where you can be most useful. Well, God wouldn't ask us to bear a cross, right? Are there some crosses that are not voluntary? What about people who are born with handicaps? Is that a kind of a cross? They didn't voluntarily choose that. Are there crosses that we choose to bear? Well, to getting, getting to the main theme of this particular lesson, why is selfishness such a huge issue? Wasn't that the original sin? Yeah, Even in heaven? You're referring to Lucifer, yeah. the original sin being selfishness. Mm -hmm. I want to be God. Mm -hmm. When we exercise selfishness, we are following directly in the footsteps of Satan himself. I'm sorry to have to say that. I know how big a problem that is, but that's true. And we find that usually selfishness is what leads us to commit other sins. Selfishness seems as natural as breathing. Well, what can we learn about that that might be useful from Luke 12, 13 to 21? Is it a sin to plan for our futures? Well, this is what it says, um, Luke 12, 31, 13 to 21. A man in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide with me the property our father left us. In other words, I want my share, right? Jesus answered him, My friend, who gave you the right to judge or to divide the property between you two? And he went on to say to them all, Watch out and guard yourselves from every kind of greed, because a person's true life is not made up of the things he owns, no matter how rich he may be. Then Jesus told them this parable. There was once a rich man who had land which bore good crops. He began to think to himself, I haven't anywhere to keep the, all my crops. What can I do? This is what I will do, he told himself. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, where I will store all my corn and all my other goods. Then I will say to myself, lucky man, you have all the good things you need for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool, this very night you will have to be, give up your life. Then who will get all these things you have kept for yourself? And Jesus concluded, this is how it is with those who pile up riches for themselves, but are not rich in God's sight. What does it mean to be rich in God's sight? The one who has the biggest bank account? Don't think so. It seems that we have quite a few of those these days. Yes, more piling up every minute it seems like. The way you look, yes. So there's some necessity to plan for the future. Yes. yes. To, you know, to have some stores of, of mm -hmm. things so that you're not dependent upon the government or your parents or your siblings or your children. Um, where's the dividing line? Yeah. Well, here's a challenging question. Why do you think this parable appears only in the Gospel of Luke? Why do you suppose, now remember, Luke was what kind of a person? He was a physician. He was a he was, Gentile. He was a fish, physician. He was a Greek physician and a Gentile. Yeah. He wasn't confined by Jewish notions and ideas. Does that have anything to do with why the other Gospel writers didn't mention it? Now there's one possibility here, and Myra could speak to this maybe. There's one possibility here that apparently what happened in the case of Luke's Gospel, when John, I'm sorry, when Paul was imprisoned in Caesarea Maritima for more than two years, Luke, who had arrived in Palestine with him, apparently started traveling around and asking, did you, meet, did you know Jesus? Did you know Jesus? What do you know about him? Tell me what you know about this man. And it's possible that he picked up this story from a woman. We don't know. He probably picked, he may have picked it up from somebody else, but obviously the disciples were there. Jesus was speaking to them. So they should have remembered. 
but they didn't or chose not to mention it. Well, was self there, there, There's only, only so far out of your natural thinking that you can go. <laughs> and this may have been a bridge too far for yeah. a Jew. Yeah. Well, and was, for us. Yes. Was selfishness a major problem among the church leaders in the days of Jesus and later, okay. when Luke was written? Yes. Surely was. How does selfishness affect our relationship with God? How does it affect our relationship with our spouses, our families? Yes. Thinking about the Jews and why they had this um, affinity for wanting to have money mm. or, and goods, was it because that meant they were blessed by God? Well, I mean, is that how it started? That let, Let's review that story. In the Old Testament, you find out that the people who are most blessed by God tended to be very rich. Abraham, yeah. Jacob, Isaac, for that matter. What about Job, you know? Yeah. So it came to, the idea came that if, if you were blessed, if you were doing God's will, he would bless you, and if he blessed you, what, what, what would, how would that? You would be so, healthy, healthy, and you would be rich. Wealthy and wise. It would, it would be seen. You don't have to explain it. Would be it. obvious. Yeah, it's just mm. the way things are. So Jesus, when he came on the scene, was not wealthy. No, that's why it healthy. says he was despised and rejected yes. of men. They and the Jews who did a lot tried to play on that very subtly sometimes as often as they could. I mean, how could this poor man be... Look at him. Yeah, look at him. You should be able to tell that he's not, he's not a saint. <laughs> yeah, if they only knew. But the words that fell from his lips uh, yeah. were pretty hard to counter. Well, Jesus said, well, Paul finally said something very important about Jesus that we need to take into account here. Jim? Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. Good News Bible. And what was the purpose of, what was, what was the crosses for in, in Roman times? Most despicable way you it could was die. A, it was a way that you punished people that were regarded as traitors to the Roman government. You know, really, the idea was to make, to, to make fun of them, to make them despised by everybody around. You know, it was, it was supposed to be the worst possible thing you could do to somebody. Well, in the parable that Jesus quoted, it would have seemed that this rich man was in great shape. But his ideas were directly contradicted by what we learned about Jesus himself in Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Well, what about us? Are we laying up treasure in heaven? How do we do that? Carrie? Reading from chapter 6, Matthew, verse 20. Instead, store up riches for yourself in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy and robbers cannot break in and steal. Again, good from the Good News Bible. Why are materialism, wealth, and getting things so attractive to us? Well, it's easier than trying to figure out how you store up riches in heaven. <laughs> Well, maybe so. Have you clearly outlined in your mind the events that happened during that last week of Jesus' life on this earth? Can you explain what happened on each day? That's a fascinating study if you get a chance to try to focus on it. Jesus met some very serious challenges, especially on Tuesday of that final week. And then on Thursday evening, remember Sunday was the, was the, was the, triumphal entry, Tuesday, well, the other things that happened on Monday, but Tuesday, there were lots of conflicts in the, in the temple court with Sadducees and Pharisees. And then uh, Thursday evening, as they were preparing to celebrate the Passover, 
and even on their way to celebrating the Passover, the disciples were arguing among themselves about who was to be greatest. Now, let's, let's, let's try to think like a disciple for a moment. Why were they arguing about that? At that particular point. Well, they just had the triumphal entry. Okay. It was apparent that Jesus was going to become the ruler, the king. And, Everybody, you know, all... I, I want to be prime minister. I want to be vice president. I want to be secretary of state. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't want to be the uh, you know some lowly uh, administrator in mm -hmm. wherever. So they were still believing that Passover, Passover was the, the time when the most people came to Jerusalem for the whole year. This was the biggest, the biggest event in the whole year. And they were thinking that this is, you know, people had been, in fact, Jesus had not stopped them from talking like that. He still, he, the huge crowd all the way from Galilee, traveling, the, you know, four or five days, six days, maybe seven days to get to, to, get to Jerusalem. And... They were, they were shouting and carrying on, and they were sure. I mean, the risk was going around all over the place. And, of course, we know that Jesus went into, fell into tears on, at that triumphal entry, and people couldn't figure out what he was crying about. So Jesus had some things to say to his disciples. Myra? From Luke 22, verses 14 to 30. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table with the apostles. Now, this is the Last Supper we're talking about. He said to them, I have wanted so much to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will never eat it again. I will never eat until it is given its fullness, full meaning in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus took the cup and gave thanks to God and said, Take this and share it among yourselves. I tell you that from now on I will not drink this wine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a piece of bread and gave thanks to God, broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, give them the cup after the supper, saying, This is the cup of God's new covenant, sealed with my blood, which is poured out for you. But look, the one who betrays me is here, at the table with me. The Son of Man will die as God has decided. But how terrible for that man who betrays him. Let me interrupt for a second. Try to think in your mind how Judas felt at that moment. Was he looking around, hoping somebody else was as guilty as he was? I mean... Yeah. And all the others. Yeah. Wondering who it yeah. was. Go ahead. Um, then he began to ask, they began to ask among themselves which one of them it could be, who was going to do this. An argument broke out among the disciples as to which of them should be thought of as the greatest. <laughs> Jesus said to them, the kings of pagans have power over their people, and the rulers claim the title of friends of the people. But this is not the way it is with you. Rather, the greatest one among you must be like the youngest. The leader must be the one, must be like the servant. Who is greater, the one who sits down to eat or the one who serves? The one who s sits down, of course. But I am among you as one who serves. You have stayed with me through all of my trials, and just as my father has, given me the right to rule, so I will give you the same right. You will eat and drink at my table in, the king, in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones and rule over the 12 dry, tribes of Israel. From the Good News Bible. Wow. Try to imagine what the disciples were thinking when Jesus said all of those things about his future. Before I suffer. Suffer? After you're going to come, after you become king, what kind of suffering is that going to be? It must be a parable. Must be some kind of. What's he talking about? Well, they of course were expecting him to be crowned king. 
Think about church politics for a moment. Oh dear, do, do we dare to do that? <laughs> How do we go about choosing who to be the church leaders in our churches, our families, or in, a workplace, in our workplace? Or is that not talked about? Jesus gave us some suggestions about how we should take our places among others in society. Gordon? Matthew 18, starting with verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So Jesus called a child, made him stand in front of them, and said, I assure you that unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who humbles himself and becomes like this child. In what way? Yeah. And whoever welcomes in my name one such child as this welcomes me. Good News Bible. Okay. Well, that's not the only place where Jesus gathered children around and, and suggested that it was something important. So let's think about that for a second. Um, what is the most important thing about children? Like you've said before, capacity to grow. The ca capacity to grow. I mean, think of what we... What? Go ahead. They're little sponges. Yeah. Think of what we would do if, if, we, if the child stopped growing physically. What would we what we do if the child stopped growing mentally? What would we do if the person, the child stopped developing socially? But when the stop, child stops growing spiritually, we think, isn't that nice? Isn't that sweet? Well, how That's does that... That's not what we should do. Not what is we... your implication. We should be <laughs> growing spiritually as well. Well, look at what Paul said in Ephesians 4. I'm reading from verses 13 to 16. And so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people, reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Then we shall no longer be children. Oh, we're not supposed to stay children? Carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind or the teaching of deceitful people who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ, who is the head. Under his control, all the different parts of the body fit together and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. From the Good News Bible again. Well, can we accept the idea that true greatness involves giving up our rights and embracing heavenly kingdom values? It is clear that the disciples have not yet reached that point. How many times do you think Jesus warned his disciples about what was coming? I mean, you know, we, we just glibly say Jesus was the best teacher who ever lived on this earth, right? And he couldn't teach his 12 closest followers what's, what was going to happen to him? Well, they, couldn't, they didn't even think about it. it. It was just, it was a different way of looking at life. They just couldn't cope with the idea. So when he even dropped some hints, they, they didn't recognize it. Uh, one of the, my favorite places to look at when that question is raised is in Luke chapter 8, starting with verse 31. Look at these words. Now here it says, Jesus speaks a third time about his death. It's, they're possibly even four times. You can't always tell between the different Gospels exactly. Oh, is this the same time as that one over in that other Gospel? But anyway, here's one of the times. Jesus, this is, they're on their way up to Jerusalem from Jericho on that last journey. Okay? And they're headed for Passover. And everybody's talking about Jesus is in this group. He's with us. He's going to be the next king. And Jesus took the twelve disciples aside and said to them, Listen, we're going up to we're going to Jerusalem where everything that prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles, who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. But the disciples did not understand any of these things. Sorry? 
The meaning was hidden from them. The meaning was hidden from them. Was it that the meaning was hidden or like children, they can't comprehend all the facets. They can only, children are very selfish, very self-centered. Yeah. We're not. Well, we, we're supposed to be mature, but we're just mature in age and... Speak for yourself. <laughs> we're, just, we're just in... Okay. Okay, sorry. Can we accept the idea that true greatness involves giving up our rights and embracing heavenly values instead? It is clear that disciples have not reached that point. Um, how many times do you think Jesus warned his disciples about the work, what was coming? That's the verse I just read to you. There are at least three or maybe four times recorded when he told them what was going to happen to him. I mean, was there anything in that verse I just read to you that would be hard to understand if, you, if your mind was open? There's no, there's no big, long, 15-syllable words, anything like that. How many times do you have to tell your children? Yeah. And until it happens to them, and then the light goes on. Mm -hmm. It's not just the children, it's the I husband. Know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the wife. I okay. say that. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> none of them were prepared when it actually happened. But Jesus did not give up on them. Jesus had some serious things to say about the spiritual leaders of Israel in his day. Jim? Matthew 23. This is one of your favorite passages. Well, I've used it a lot. <laughs> Starting at verse 13 to 15, uh, 23, 25, 27, and 29. How terrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You lock the door to the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves don't go in, nor do you allow in those who are trying do to you, enter. You allow in those, allow who in those who are trying to enter. I'm sorry. How terrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You sail the seas and cross whole countries to win one convert, and when you succeed, you make him twice as deserving of hell as you deserve, as you yourself are. Let me interrupt for a second. Are. This is an important verse suggesting that people ask, well, didn't anybody before Jesus' time try to evangelize anybody? Yeah, they did. It says so right here. Right. So this, this, the idea that Christians should go out and evangelize the world, it wasn't completely new. You know, I counted the woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. I found there was eight of them in the uh, King James Version, but seven of them in the, all the other versions. Really? Yeah, you know, there's uh, verse 14 is not there in, in most of the other versions. I see. Okay. Um, which word we started? Number 15? Yeah. How terrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrite, hypocrites. You sail the seas, cross the whole countries in, to win one convert, and when you succeed, you make him twice as deserving of going to hell as you yourselves are. Yeah, we Verse 23. How terrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give to God a tenth of even the seasoning herbs, such as mint, dill, and cumin but you neglect to obey the really important teachings of the law, such as justice and mercy and, and honesty. These you should practice without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain a fly out of, its, out of your drink, but swallow a camel. <laughs> mm. How terrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of your cup and plate, while the inside is full of what you have obtained by violence and selfishness. Blind Pharisee, clean this, excuse me, clean what is out, inside the cup first, and then the outside will be clean too. How terrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look fine on the outside, but are full of bones and declaimed corpses on the inside. In the same way, you on the outside you appear good to everybody, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and sins. Wow. Verse 29, how terrible for you, teachers of the law and hypocrites, Pharisees and your, you hypocrites. You make fine tombs for the prophets and decorate the monuments of those who lived, lived good lives. Good News Bible. Now, 
there's something important about this. Notice that there's an exclamation point after Pharisees. You hypocrites. It's not scribes, Pharisees, Pharisees hypocrites. and hypocrites. Because that would sound like scribes are here, Pharisees are in here, it's hypocrites over here. No, it's you scribes and you Pharisees, you both are hypocrites. Yeah. Another thing, here, you see, if, if the, what we call the Old Testament was done, was complete, and we're teaching the right message, hmm. could be Jesus would not have needed to, to, to appear. Well, if they had accepted it and lived by it. Well, yeah, and he says, you've, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. So he's, ha he's having to do some correcting of, of those yeah. uh, texts. Do you understand clearly what a hypocrite is? Hupo is, means under. Crite means a mask. Think of all the people you know, including yourself. Do any of them act like hypocrites? Hypocrite was the, was the name for actor. So you want, to go, you want to see a bunch of hypocrites? Go down to Hollywood. Those are uh -oh. little. Don't say that. <laughs> Well, that's what the word means. That's amazing how people will spend a lot of money on, on hypocrites. Yeah. And, and for amusement and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Carrie? Jesus associates four char characteristics with the scribes and Pharisees. In the spectrum of Judaism in the first century AD, the Pharisees represented the conservative religious right. They were interested in the written and oral law and emphasized ritual purity. On the other side of the spectrum were the Sadducees, a group of mostly wealthy leaders often associated with the elite priestly class. They were highly Hellenized, Hellenized rather, i.e. they spoke Greek and were at home in Greek philosophy and did not believe in a judgment or an afterlife. We would describe them as liberals. Both rules, both groups rather, were guilty of hypocrisy from the adult Sabbath school Bible study guide for the Wednesday. Are we ever inclined to hold up, hold up others to a higher standard than we hold up for ourselves? Do we like to see, do we like to have people praise us for our religious activities? Do we sometimes even try to claim honor and recognition that is due to God alone? Oh dear. What is it? The text he says, you see the speck in somebody else's eye, but you can't see the log in your own eye. There it is, right there. It's hard to see. <laughs> what, is what is amazing is that Jesus continued to deal with his disciples in a very loving way, despite their foibles. Divine pity marked the countenance of the Son of God as he cast one lingering look upon the temple and then on his, upon his hearers. In a voice choked by deep anguish of heart and bitter tears, he exclaimed, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how thou, uh, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are set, <laughs> I, can, I have a hard time reading this, um, which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and ye would not, from Matthew twenty-three thirty-seven, King James Version. And that's all from Ellen White's book, The Desire of Ages, page 620, paragraph 1. Soon after they were arguing about who should be greatest, what assurance did Jesus give the disciples, those same disciples? From John 14, starting with verse 1, Do not be worried and upset, Jesus told them. Believe in God and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house, and I am going to prepare a place for you. I would not tell you this if it were not so. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself so that you will be where I am. You will know the way that leads to the place where I am going. <clears throat> Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way to get there? Jesus answered him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. It's from the Good News Bible. Well, what was Jesus' initial response to the comment by Thomas? 
Do we really believe what Jesus said is recorded in John 10.10? 10? And I quote, The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come in order that you might have life, life in all its fullness. I call that uh, the abundant life. Yes. Are Christians really the ones who are living the abundant life? Paul seemed assured when he spoke to the Philippians that Jesus was able to finish what he planned to do. Now, do we know where, what do we know about the history of when the Philippians was written? Paul had been in prison in, in Caesarea, Phil, uh, Caesarea Maritima for two to three years. Then he'd been on that terrible ship ride where they, the, the whole ship crashed and so forth like this and spent the winter in Malta. And then he'd finally gone on to Rome. He'd been in prison in Rome for about two years. And as he's, it looks like there's a possibility, at least a possibility, that he might get out. He wrote Ephesians and Colossians, and then when he was pretty sure it was, he was going to get out, he wrote to the Philippians. And they had been sending him money to t try to support him during that time. So he's now writing to them. And he says, And so I'm sure that God, who began this, this good work in you, will carry it on until it is finished on the day of Christ Jesus. So he, he saw history moving in a steady line and steady direction to the coming of Jesus Christ. So what about us? Do we live on a day-by-day -day basis with our lives anchored in the assurance of what Jesus plans to do for us? The assurance of what Jesus plans to do for us? No matter how bad things may appear on this earth, God has a glorious plan for us in the life hereafter. It is helpful to see some of the mistakes made by the disciples. That gives us courage that God does not give up on us. And we can go way back to the Old Testament, Jeremiah 3, and what do we read there? Verse 22, Return all of you who have turned away from the Lord. He will heal you and make you faithful. You say, yes, we are coming to the Lord because He is our God. Good News Bible. The term heal, see? That's yeah. another word for salvation. Yes. And Jeremiah. What do we know about the days of Jeremiah? Well, I've got a text I learned about from uh, one of our members years ago, and that was Jeremiah 8, verse 8. Whoa, excuse me. The scribes say, oh, we've got the law, but their lying pen has made it into a lie. And uh, Okay, so those were, he was talking about the, those who opposed Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah himself lived a very, very difficult life. Boy, um, you know those. And living through three times being in Jerusalem, three times it was captured, it was, it was conquered, and finally the last time it was completely destroyed. Imagine living through all of that. Well, most of our Christian friends, now let's think about Christian ideas. Most of our Christian friends believe that when a person dies, their soul goes directly either to heaven or to hell. But we as Seventh-day Adventists are people who believe that a person sleeps in death. We are able to understand, therefore, the issues involved in the pre-advent judgment. Why is the pre-advent judgment important? Well, the Bible talks about judgment, so our Christian friends believe that the judgment happens for each person exactly at his death? Is that the way it works? Any of us prepared to discuss that? You, no, it can't, I mean, and God talks, I mean, the New Testament talks repeatedly about the judgment that will take place just before Jesus comes again. Does that mean that some of the people in heaven are going to be judged not fit to be there and have to be sent to hell, and some of the people in hell are going to be sent, di dis discovered that they're really fit to be in heaven, so God calls them up? Why? God doesn't make mistakes like that. God doesn't make that kind of mistakes. So, um, Is there a hell like, well, like people think of? Not the no, kind that isn't. people think of. Yeah. And the judgment, another term for that is separation. Yeah. So the terms, you know, if we could put a little different spin on things if you realize well, it's separating between the good and the bad yeah well you, you actually heaven is for many respects is self-selected 
Mm-hmm. I mean, it would be a hell for a person to have to go to heaven and live live in an environment that they had shown that they have no interest in <laughs> prior to. So yeah. it would be. Uh, Imagine living in a place where you had to be good and you didn't want to be good. Uh, that's almost like some kids living at home, huh? You have to got the story of the thief on the cross, <laughs> you know? Yeah. He, he was, and then he the story of the prodigal son. Yeah. You know? Unless we are able to root out some of the selfish traits in our lives, we cannot be true followers of Jesus. Gary? There can be no growth or fruitfulness in the life that is centered in self. If you have accepted Christ as a personal savior, you are to forget yourself and try to help others. Talk of the love of Christ, tell of his goodness. Do every duty that presents itself. Carry the burden of souls upon your heart and by every means in your power seek to save the lost. As you receive the spirit of Christ, the spirit of unselfish love and labor for others, you will grow and bring forth fruit. The graces of the Spirit will ripen in your character. Your faith will increase, your convictions deepen, your love be made perfect. More and more you will reflect the likeness of Christ in all that is pure, noble, and lovely. And that comes from Ellen White's Christ Object Lessons, page 67 through 68. Ellen White elsewhere said something that's quite remarkable. These were back in the early days when there were people who'd come in from a lot of different churches and they had some really different ideas and they, they, they almost took out their boxing gloves trying to work out these details. And this is what she said. Um, Myra? I'm sorry. We're in dealing with issues? With... I'm sorry. I was... In dealing with the issues between church members, this, that's in brackets. in brackets. Conversation has been protracted for hours between the parties concerned. And not only has their time been wasted, but the servants of God are held to listen to them. We have to sit here and listen to these arguments. Okay, yeah. go ahead. When the hearts of both parties are unsubdued by grace. If pride and selfishness were laid aside, five minutes would result, would we remove most difficulty? <laughs> Early <laughs> writings, 119. Five minutes would remove most difficulties. So could it be true that selfishness... is isn't saying that we're stubborn, is it? That they were stubborn? Of course not. I hope that five minutes isn't put, uh, prophetic time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, how can we set goals for ourselves that lead us to the elimination of selfishness? I mean, do we really want to get rid of selfishness? Maybe we don't want to. Can we hold each other accountable as well? Not just ourselves. Can we, can we tell everybody else that we're holding you accountable? It is not a sin to be ambitious. Let us be honest, most of us are good at hiding selfish ambition, hypocrisy, selfishness, and every, even envy. We want people to like us, but we recognize that selfishness is still in our lives. Is the Holy Spirit capable of helping us to root out those selfish, root, selfish roots? And you're thinking, is it possible that Jesus could be coming again one of these days soon? What signs do you see in the world around us that hint that such a time is near? These lessons discusses, this lesson discusses some touchy subjects. We, you know, it's nice to talk about theological things or stories from the Bible or something like that, that don't sort of really touch our lives. But when you start talking about selfishness, that's kind of personal, isn't it? We don't often talk about these things, but we need to decide how they impact us as individuals. God does not want any of us to be lost. But he cannot, I believe, admit to heaven people who, would, who were motivated by selfishness. That person would just start the great controversy all over again. If we constantly remind ourselves of God's plans for our lives, does that make it easier to get rid of selfishness? Think again about what we read earlier in Philippians 2, 5 to 7 or 8, and 
let this attitude be in you as it was in Jesus Christ and the lower he kept going down lower and lower and lower until finally he he died the death of a common criminal what a contrast between our natural selfishness and the experience of Jesus from the adult teachers Sabbath school Bible study guide page 40 is this the Greek word for form is morph and, which, and so this is a context of Philippians, where it says, in the form of godliness. Okay, go ahead. Which can also be translated as, quote, the essence of, or having the, quote, nature of. Jesus was equal with the Father in the very essence of his nature. Christ existed with the Father from all eternity as co-equal and co-eternal. He made himself of no reputation, or literally translated, he emptied himself of his privileges and prerogatives as God's equal and became a man. He not only became a man, but he also became the lowest of men, a servant. He not only became a servant, but he also became a humble, obedient servant. He not only became a man who was a humble, obedient servant, but he also died the death of the cross, the most horrible of all deaths. Jesus, our eternal Lord, our all-powerful creator, the one served by all, became the servant of all. Jesus' life graphically illustrates that a life of self-sacrificial self service is a life of restfulness and lasting joy. Okay. Now, this whole series of lessons is on resting in Christ. Do we find in our personal experiences, do you out there, Find in your personal experiences that serving others, being obedient and humble, do you find that that brings real joy? Or do you feel happier if you're selfish? Do we really believe that to give, to give produces more peace and joy than getting? Try to imagine what was going on in the thinking of the disciples following that triumphal entry on Sunday. They thought, you know, oh, all we need to do is just get down to this hill and up the other side and into the temple. We can declare him king. By Thursday evening, the time for the Passover meal had come. What had happened in their thinking in that during that week, part of a week? We have suggested in the past that James and John may have been cousins of Jesus. And what happened in their case, this is, you know, during the last Passover week, Matthew 20, verses 20 to 25, then the wife of Zebedee came to Jesus with her two sons, bowed before him and asked him a favor. Now, some scholars who've looked very carefully at the people, the women who are gathered around the, the, the cross and so forth and putting this other pieces of the story together, think it's quite possible that James and John were cousins of Jesus. So this would make her an aunt of Jesus, and she's thinking, you know, we're family here. Can't, can't you just assure us that, Jesus, when you become king, you'll just put my two sons, one on one side and one on the other? She had no clue. <laughs> what do you want, asked Jesus. Jesus asked her, and of course Jesus already knew. She answered, promise me that these two sons of mine will sit on your right and your left when you are king. When you are king. You don't know what you're asking for, Jesus answered, answered the sons. Can you drink the cup of suffering that I'm about to drink? We can, they answered. You will indeed drink my cup, Jesus told them, but I do not have the right to choose who will sit on my right hand and my left. These places belong to those for whom my father has prepared them. When the other ten disciples heard about this, they became angry with the two brothers. So Jesus called them all together and said, You know that the rulers of the heathen have power over them, and the leaders have complete authority. This, however, is not the way it shall be among you. If one of you wants to be great, he must be the servant of the rest. And if one of you wants to be first, he must be your slave. Like the Son of Man, who did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life to redeem many people. In the Mark version of that story, mm -hmm. it's actually the disciples, yes. James and John, who, who come to and ask Jesus. 
for this. They probably brought their mother to yeah. add a little. Mom, help us. Yes. <laughs> so what do you think was happening in that story? Jim? Here's the background of the story. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem for the final time. He has unsuccessfully tried to explain to his disciples that he soon will be rejected, tried, falsely accused, and crucified. For some reason, their presuppositions about the Messiah have kept them from understanding the entire, understanding the nature of his mission. They filtered what Jesus says through the mistaken ideas of earthly greatness that swirl around in their heads. Their ideas of prominence to a new kingdom and of worldly greatness are the basis for James and John's mother, re, mother's request found in Matthew 20, verse 20 and 21, Bible study guide. Once again, I'm gonna ask the question, why do you suppose it was Luke, the only non-Jewish writer in the New Testament that recorded this story? Who do you think told Luke? Was he told this by an angel because none of the disciples were willing to admit it? Would John have told the story? It is true that James and John, along with Peter, are considered to be among the inner, among the inner circle. We know that of Jesus' Jesus's disciples. And Jesus said, Matthew 19, 28, you can be sure that when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne in the New Age, then you 12 followers of mine will also sit on thrones to rule the 12 tribes of Israel. So now, what have we learned in this lesson? Clearly, Jesus, in his life and in his ministry, lived the absolutely opposite of a selfish life. And yet, selfishness seems to be so dominant in our world today, so dominant in our lives. And we don't like to talk about it because it's, you know, it's sort of like, you know, used to say to, when, when someone, a kid would point his finger at you, you'd say, yeah, one finger is pointing at me and all the other fingers are pointing back at you. It seems a little bit like that, doesn't it? Well, are we guilty? Are any of us selfish? Jesus talked about the rulers of other nations and said, you know, that's what Gentiles do, but it's not supposed to be that way in the kingdom of heaven. And I can assure you, Jesus said, when you get to heaven, when you join me there, it will not be like that. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to have these stories and these ideas presented to us in such a winsome way. Um, and yet, Lord, it's so hard to give up our natural tendencies to selfishness. As small babies, we, we just we, we want everything to be given to us. It just seems natural, and we, it's hard to grow out of that. But Lord, we know that the only way to heaven is through you, through your example, and following that example. Help us to learn all that we are supposed to do and practice you, practice being like you each day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.